We continue our series about learning more about classes with talking about memory management and how it works with objects and compare that to how it works with primitive data types in Java. The objectives for this video are mainly three ideas. A student will understand how memory management works for objects and is different from how it works with primitive data types. Understand the cause and prevention of a null pointer exception, when that might occur and what we need to be careful of. And then understand what null means for an object in several ways. You can assign null to an object, just like you can fill a value of a primitive data type. We will look at the contents of the memory allocated to an object and before you initialize it to anything, it is null and then it is filled when you initialize it, similar to but different from a primitive data type. And then what happens if an object has no reference to it for a certain period of time? We continue on with the examples in the student class. And I do have a table, and like this says, it's two slides down, but some introduction to that table are as follows. Let's say that we have student S1, like I had similar in my constructor and driver pairing classes that we just finished. And S1 is assigned new student, open close. We remember that that is calling on the default constructor with student, and now we have a little bit more understanding of what that does. We do stuff with student S1, but then we're done. What you can do is you can assign null, and this is a reserved word, all lowercase n-u-l-l. -L. Null is assigned to S1. That means you can't use S1 again unless you give it a value or you make a new student like you did up here. Table 5.2, the one on the next slide, also demonstrates that assignments to primitive data types are stored very differently to what is stored in an object. So here's the table that I've been referring to. And right up here we have some comfortable integers, int, i, and j. So there are two integers. And this shows it very much like I've shown it on the board. I have said that that's garbage, and we know that default values of numeric data fields are zero, but I would much rather you think of them as garbage, as being unfilled. So the contents are unknown, but we know that they're going to be holding integers and they have been sized for the data type int. Now we assign three to i, and whatever's in i we assign to j, and so first we put a three in i, doesn't remember ever that it was garbage, and now whatever the contents of i is, is assigned to j. So they both have a value of three. And this would be a good depiction of what is actually stored in the memory location in the four bytes, remember, that an int contains. Objects, however, are very different. This line, student s, t, is declaring two students and it is supposed to be analogous to this line up here declaring two integers. No values were put in this integer, they contain garbage, and no values have been put in here. And in fact, you could think of this as garbage, but I would also be fine with you thinking of this as null. It is not referencing anything yet. It has no real contents, but I also want you to think that it is null. S and T are memory locations, the table says, that have not been initialized, but which will hold references to student objects. Now this is very new. What is going to be put inside S and put inside T is actually a hex address like this to the memory where it points. So now when we say S is assigned new student, what this new does, we've been wondering about it for a while, this new says Hey, go grab enough memory. How much memory? Enough for a student, whatever that means as far as its whole package of information. And in here, instead of garbage, put a hex address. And that hex address is saying, okay, go out somewhere where the computer is available and go make a student object 
and actually ignore this. This hasn't been done yet. Go make a student object and I'm going to point to this. So very clear black and white difference between what is contained in a, an object, a hex address that points to the information that the student contained. What is contained in a primitive data type is the actual value of that object. Once again, an object holds a hex address. A primitive data type holds the value that you have placed in there. Now this is a little funky. I'm not making another copy with the copy constructor. I have not used the word new here. So this basically says, hey, whatever's in the contents of S, which is a hex address pointing to an address somewhere that the computer has grabbed, whatever the contents of S are, assign that to T. T says, okay, well that's fine. I'm an object and I'm ready to hold a student. And so S has the hex address for a student. Okay, I'm happy with that. So S and T refer to, point to, the same student object. This table is nice because it draws a very similar analogy between primitive data types up here, what happens when you declare them and then initialize them, and initialize them in such a way that the contents of one are assigned to another. But you might do this pretty frequently for a primitive data type. You probably would not do this very often for an object because guess what? If you were to say s.setName, s, s, and t refer to the same student. So if you said s.setName, t's name would also be set because they refer to the same thing. Here's a slightly different way of thinking about it. Here's a primitive data type. They want number to be an int and they declare it and initialize it right away. And so inside the contents after this line of code is 45 in number. Here's a string and it is an object. A string is an object and its name is word. But what is in the contents of word? It is the hex address to where the computer grab memory enough for two characters that make up the string word. As our first example showed, you can go right ahead and assign null to a student if you're done with it. In this particular case, we made student student. I would rather you never have an identifier. That's the same as a name of a class. I consider that poor judgment, but this is what our book did. Anyway, it used the student constructor that accepted a string that was put into the name and the three test scores. We did stuff with it, and so we want to go ahead and assign this to null. We don't want anything more to happen to the student named student, and this is perfectly acceptable. Typically, you mark a null with a slash like this. When you made the new student, and you use the constructor that filled it up with these values, you still made an object, so you still stored the hex address in there, and it pointed to a block in memory that put all of this stuff together. You used up this particular student, and then you can write all lowercase null in here, but it is also standard to show that student points nowhere, has a value of null with a slash like this through the box. This is kind of hanging in the breeze, and Java doesn't have an overt way of telling the system that you are done using that memory. So this has no reference to it. This is a student object, all nice and packaged up, has no reference to it because we've assigned null to student. The garbage collector goes along, sees an unreferenced object, throws that away, and then the memory can be claimed for something else. One way to protect something, if you are not sure that the object has been initiated yet, initialized yet, or you just want to double check and you don't want to get a null pointer exception, which happens when you try to use a student, but the student had no value, you can say if student is equal to null, well, don't do anything else. Do what you want to try to do. For instance, here I said we've named this string str and we've assigned it null. It does not 
point to anywhere. Then we say system.out.println str.length. Now we haven't talked about the methods available for a string, but one thing that you can do for a string object is you can ask how many characters it contains. And so, but str, this string, is assigned null. So what we're trying to do is use an object and, and invoke one of the methods, but this object doesn't point to anywhere. There is no string str. It is filled with null. So that's what a null pointer exception is. And those will come up quite a bit this fall until you get used to working with objects. I want to go back one more time to this table that we talked about and just focus on the word new. When you have an object in Java, you have to declare it in that somewhat awkward way. If we declared an initialized student s all in one line, we would say student s is assigned new student, and we are calling the default constructor. And it seems really awkward. But now I think you understand a little bit better. Student s just says, hey, go get ready for a student, but I'm not filled with anything yet. Actually, technically, it's filled with null. And then now, this new says, I am in Java. I am grabbing new memory. That's the actual go out in within the computer, grab a place of memory that's legal to grab it for an object assignment. And I need as much memory as a student would take. So the reserved word new is the actual grabbing of the memory location and filling that up in an object. That's all.